This is the uh, third plenary of the day, and it is the final one. Uh, so let me welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the uh, PAMAC um, team. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a one-hour plenary, so we have a lot to cover in a very short period of time. We have a stellar, stellar um, keynotes and panel uh, participating in this. As such, I want to just say a couple of things. One, I'm going to try and keep my presence here at a minimum because what I would like to be able to do is to free up as much time once the presentations are finished for you to be able to ask questions. So I would ask you as you're listening, think of your questions and you'll see in the aisles microphone. So I'm hoping that we can bring the um, this presentation portion of this panel uh, to closure by 35 minutes after the hour, which will leave us 25 minutes to have a robust, dynamic, interactive experience between the participants here uh, and yourselves. The other thing that's a bit different in this panel and discussion is that three of the participants are on the screens in front of you. They're virtual, and we have two here. So it's a little awkward on some level, but I'm sure we can work our way through it. So the discussion here is about overcoming the challenges and harnessing the opportunities for the health at the biodiversity climate nexus. And there's two words I want to make sure you pay particular attention to in that title. That's challenges and opportunities. That is the focus of this discussion today. So with that said, I would like to introduce, we have, as I said, two keynote presentations. Uh, the first, we heard from Dr. Shiva earlier this morning. She's with us live in this presentation. And Dr. Shiva uh, will provide us with the opening keynote presentation. So, Dr. Shiva, if we could bring Dr. Shiva up on the screen and offer her the opportunity. Thank, thank you so much. Now we can hear you. We couldn't hear you in the beginning, those of us who are joining you remotely. Um, it's a pleasure to join all of you, both the panelists and Dr. Navarro, as well as all who have gathered. Um, over the years, I have realized that we have not paid enough attention to the Earth's living systems, her ability to self-regulate her biosphere and her atmosphere. Over four billion years, a dead Earth, using the microbes and using the plants, has created the possibilities of human beings on this planet. We are just recent arrivals compared to our ancestors, the microbes and the plants. And through photosynthesis, harvesting the free energy of the sun, transforming it into oxygen that we can breathe, absorbing the carbon dioxide and giving us food, the amazing molecule of life. We have arrived at a planet that is hospitable for us. The temperatures without life on earth were about 200 degrees. Now they're 13, they, they became 13. They were get going through global warming again. And a carbon rich atmosphere of 98% has been reduced to 0.03% by these processes of living systems. I always see the close connection between the biosphere and the atmosphere, between the capacity of the biodiversity to not just have created the climate, but to give us adaptation strategies, to give us mitigation strategies. The climate problem that we face today is of very recent creation. The data is so clear that it's just the 200 years of industrialization based on fossil fuels that has allowed the building up of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, 
the nitrous oxide from fossil fuel derived synthetic fertilizers, the methane from huge amounts of waste dump, waste food, factory farms. Of this, 50% is based on an industrial globalized food system. I wrote a book in the lead up to Copenhagen called Soil Not Oil, I was trying to make sense of why we were neglecting food systems in the discussion on the climate, but also how can food systems that work for the health of the planet, the health of the soil and our health, how can they be a solution both to the climate instability as well as biodiversity erosion, because the same processes destroy both and they destroy our health. 11 to 15% of the greenhouse gases come from the agriculture production based on fossil fuel intensive mechanization and fossil fuel intensive chemicalization. The nitrous fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizers are now emitting nearly 1.1 billion tons of CO2 equivalents every year. And they're creating dead zones, but they're also destroying the soil's ability to be living and to recycle both carbon and nitrogen. Three to 5% of all fossil fuel goes in the making of synthetic fertilizers. So if 200 years ago, we were able to change the way we lived, instead of living through biodiversity with biodiversity, now depending on 600 million years of the fossilization of living carbon into dead carbon, only 100 years, we have managed to take oil and fossil fuels and convert them into the petrochemicals, whether it's the plastic that's ruining the ocean or whether it is the synthetic chemicals that are going into industrial agriculture. So it's direct production is 15%, but that agriculture also requires limitless invasion because it's an agriculture based not on health, not on what people need to eat. We used to grow and eat some of it wild, 10,000 species of plants. But once commodification takes over, what matters is just the few commodities. So about 12 commodities are growing everywhere. And increasingly, food has stopped being food. 90% of the corn and soya being cultivated now is going for biofuel and animal feed, contributing to hunger on the one hand, but to increased emissions on the other. 15 to 18% of the emissions come from invading into forests, the same place from where we are getting new emergence of infectious diseases. Why are we growing GM soya in the Amazon? Why are we growing palm oil and destroying the forests of Indonesia, the forests of Malaysia? According to the UN, by 2030, most of those forests will be gone. 15 to 20% comes from processing, transport, I call it food miles, packaging, and retail. Now, does that help us with our diet or does it make it worse? Ultra processed food is recognized as a single biggest contribution, contributor to chronic diseases. Food miles requires a degradation of food and huge amounts of preservatives. Packaging, I, I did a, a, a survey once and got my students to just segregate waste. And 75% of the waste is related to packaging. And of course, there's a large amount of waste, 2.4% of food waste that also contributes to the huge amounts of methane. Now, in each of these places, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to shift from the 100-year mistake of using synthetic chemicals in agriculture which also decreased the nutrition in food. 80% of the nutrition in food has disappeared wherever chemicals are used to grow food. Wherever there's organic, there's an increase because organic food feeds the soil. The soils create the phytochemicals and the nutrition that, that makes for healthy food. So it's not the weight that matters. That's why in Navdanya, we don't measure yield per acre. What matters is that we have nutrition in our food. We need nutrition density in our food. 
we definitely need to reduce ultra-processed food and not go into hyper-processing and lab food. We need to reduce food miles and localization. Look at the huge progress made in bio districts, in local circular economies. That is where we both reduce emissions, regenerate biodiversity and improve our health. Most importantly, the shrinkage of our thinking from what I call the monocultures of the mind has shrunk what we grow. We used to grow climate resilient crops and Navdhani the movement has started on seed saving. We've regenerated them after disasters, after cyclones. We are able to distribute these seeds that can tolerate salt, that can tolerate floods. Droughts are the other extreme. Our wonderful millets and 2023 is the year of millets and I celebrate it with all of you because millets were made forgotten foods, primitive grains that are not worthy of eating just because they were colored and they were a little dark. We were celebrating whiteness in flour and whiteness in sugar and whiteness in everything. Today, these darker colors are where nutrition comes from. But our research shows and all, all research shows that the millets are climate resilient of the highest level. So we have both nutrition density and climate resilience packed into these forgotten foods, which should become foods of the future. And I know it is in our hands to address the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis and the health crisis together. There lies the opportunity of the health movement. Dr. Shiva. Thank you. Dr. Shiva, thank you very much. I would like now to turn to uh, Dr. Nabara. And you can... It's an absolute delight to be here, to be in Bangkok, to be at PMAC 2023, and to have the honor of following uh, Dr. Shiva Vandana to make some remarks. And in a way, I hope what I will do is to react to the points that Dr. Shiva has made and to suggest ways in which, as public health actors, we, we can overcome some of the challenges and harness some of the opportunities that are being identified so clearly in this first day of the conference. I thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes talking about myself because I'm quite I'm quite old. What have I done? I'm a public health doctor who has spent really the last 30, 35 years working on issues that influence people's health. But I've been pretty much outside the health sector. We're working on pandemic preparedness, actually a lot with Dr. Dennis Carroll but through One Health and whole of society approaches. Working on climate action, trying to bring nature-based solutions more centrally into global discussions. Working on people's emotional resilience in the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis. Working on whole of society responses to Ebola and COVID-19. and trying to move forward with nature positive, nutrition sensitive and people centered transformation of food systems. And I'm delighted that uh, Vanita Kamenpach is here from Thailand, who's been leading that work in this country. And perhaps now trying to work on responding effectively to the current worldwide food, energy and finance crisis in the United Nations Global Crisis Response Group. In all this work, I was also active as we, as a world, moved from having millennium development goals, which were coming into force in 2000, to the Sustainable Development Agenda, which was agreed by the leaders of all world nations in 2015. And there was a big difference over that time. In the Millennium Development Goals, the focus was on outcomes that could occur in poor communities 
uh, and it was very much development focused. But there was a revolt when this Millennium Development Goal agenda was reviewed in uh, Rio de Janeiro in 2012. And leaders of many delegations said, no, the next development agenda has to be global because there are things the rich world needs to do, probably more urgently than the poor world, and one of those is dealing with climate change and the destruction of nature. And so I watched that shift happen, and I ask myself now, have we, who are public health actors, done enough to catch up with that global shift? Have we actually done justice to it? And I've got seven things I'd like to suggest. The first is I think we can do more if we work on health from outside the health sector, recognizing what uh, Sir Michael Marmot says, that, that, that actually social, economic, and even political determinants of health may be as important or more important than microbes and dysfunction in bodily systems. And so I think that given those multiple determinants, there is scope for societies to enjoy better health as a result of focused action on food, focused action on climate, focused action on biodiversity. And we have to actually stand up and say that at all times. It means facing up to the underlying economic and societal causes of ill health. It means facing up to the structural factors that actually make those causes so pronounced and make them so hard to deal with. It means being uncomfortable. It means acting on this through making public health a truly cross-sectoral and inter interdisciplinary issue and making that our careers. Second, if we're going to do that, we have to be ready to focus more on places and places where people live and work, places where poor people live and work, because all my experience is that poor people suffer the most, poor people experience the greatest pain and hardship and poor people have the least redress to do with that. Yes, there are human rights accords, but say that to some of the people who are suffering at the moment as a result of the effects of the climate crisis or the effects of loss of nature, and they will simply say, I need to eat and I also need to stay safe. So we have to act on this, first of all, by always doing disaggregated analyses and also being very careful when we talk about we needing to change something, we need to be clear whether we're talking on behalf of elites like ourselves or people who've got much, much less in the way of income and assets. So places, poverty, and people has to be the focus of our attention. Thirdly, I think that I like to say, and I hope you can agree, that... In our world today, people and the human race has the power to be the solution of many issues. When we had COVID causing such terrible challenges, I was articulating that the virus is the problem and people are the solution. People are not the problem. Particularly poor people are not the problem. And by the same token, I'd like to suggest that people have to be enabled to be the solution to nexus-related health challenges. And that means that all our efforts must put people at the center of the response and through innovations given to them to be able to work with, rather than extracting from them, the focus has to be on agency of people to be able to act. Because if they don't have the agency, they won't be able to act and you have that, have that agency, they can be partners in the response. We should never refer to people as objects. Fourthly, multiple stakeholders need to be engaged at all times. For example, food systems are more likely to transform if 
the different stakeholders involved in those systems can connect, engage, and explore options together in a systematic way. And that means, as we've heard from Dr. Shiva this morning during her opening keynote, the diversity is absolutely key to the future. Well, I'm suggesting diversity of engagement is also important, and it includes, I believe, engaging with people we don't agree with. I think that very little can be achieved if we just connect with people we, we agree with. A lot more can be achieved if our engagement is with those with whom we disagree. Now, I'd also like to suggest that attention be paid at least as much to identities of who is active on an issue, the relationships between them, and what they're enabled to share as the attention we give to protocols, procedures, and organizational structures. Because we know that in any organization, it is about the relationships and the value systems, and therefore the trust and the meaning that comes to our work that makes a difference. And once we do that, we can go an awful lot further and faster. And so let's prioritize moments for specialists from different disciplines to be able to come together and to establish solutions. And then I'd like to suggest that we also in that process need to find ways to recognize that extreme positions rep actually represent the key guardrails for what we do. But actually life is about negotiating in the middle space. That's tense, that's difficult, and we often feel very vulnerable. We may feel extremely humble, uh, because there are so many uncertainties we have. We may have to be careful with our language. We may have to avoid dumping guilt onto people because in the end, if we're going to engage more in the issues that concern us, we have to make their entry into those issues less painful. And that means helping them to recognize that, yes, there are extreme positions, but there's space to navigate in the middle, and that's where most of life takes place. Well... And lastly, I'd like to say that the interdisciplinary science, multisectoral working, and the living systems, mind and heart sets that we need for this kind of work are absolutely key, and they're not optional extras. Every medical student should learn this stuff. In Sunway University, Professor Jalmila Mahmoud is going to make sure that all students learn it. Healthcare without harm practices it, and I would like to suggest that we need to encourage the Prince Mahidol uh, uh, Award Conference to, to actually foster lots of daughters and sons around the world that it provide the space and the opportunity, the legitimate space and opportunity for the kind of intersectoral, people-centered working that I've just referred to, to actually flourish and be seen as legitimate and not something a bit off on the margins. I, I charted a path on this work myself over the years, and I'm super pleased that it's kind of worked out. But many, many people who tried to do the same as me did not have all the opportunities and privileges that I did. I would like to be sure that henceforth, every public health person who wants to try to build a career outside the formal health sector can actually have the opportunity to do so. Thank you. David, thank you. Let me, uh, before we move on to the panel, just refer everyone into the documents you have or detailed biographies uh, of all of the speakers. Uh, they're definitely worth a read. Uh, they speak to an extraordinary uh, range of experiences. We're now going to move on with that uh, to the panel, and we will have our first panelist will be sh uh, showing up on the screen. It is Kobe Brand. And she has uh, a variety of titles, um, of which are the Global Director for the ICLEI Cities Biodiversity Center uh, in South Africa, I believe. So, Kobe, please begin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to start by saying what a privilege it is for me to represent ICLEI. Uh, 
um, local governments for sustainability here today at this very, very prestigious occasion and to be joined by such amazing fellow panelists. Um, and I'm so thrilled with the two interventions that we've had. Let me come now um, with um, an intervention focusing more on the urban, where people live. And David, you touched on this. So we know that our future is an increasingly urban one. More than half of the world's population already live in cities. And this is an ongoing trend. Nature's ecosystems provide many essential services uh, that, that our very lives depend on. Uh, and globally, we have taken uh, nature for granted and biodiversity is diminishing at alarming rates. We've heard this. With current consumption and production patterns putting one million species at risk of extinction, which threatens our future on Earth. However, solutions can be found. And many, so many of these solutions are actually right on our doorstep in our cities. And as you rightfully say, in our poorer communities as well. That's out of desperation, innovation grows in so many forms, and we need to celebrate and harness that. Indeed, local and subnational governments are hubs of innovation and solutions. The critical role of local and subnational governments in shaping and implementing the global biodiversity agenda is increasingly rec being recognized through a number of CBD or Convention on Biological Diversity decisions since 2008 and now again in December we saw so many of the decisions that came out of COP15 focusing on cities or subnational governments as a whole. Implementation of nature-based solutions can be encouraged through mainstreaming biodiversity into policy and planning in our cities, like land use planning, where does one build, where doesn't one build, etc., and through helping cities access and secure diverse biodiversity and ecological infrastructure finance streams. Since this panel today is the first time that nature-based solutions will be featured at the a very prestigious Prince Maidel Award Conference, it is also fitting that I refer briefly to our very exciting NBS initiatives called Cities with Nature and Regions with Nature, two global initiatives open to cities and regions and partners to join freely. These unique partnership initiatives provide platforms that connect a global community of cities, regions, partner organizations and experts taking action for nature. It provides key resources to cities, including informative and scientifically robust guides and communities of practice, tools and resources, and importantly, a mechanism for cities and regions to track their biodiversity commitments on our action platform. With over 278 cities, large ones like London, Paris, Los Angeles, etc., but also smaller cities all over the global south as well, and regions from 68 countries uh, globally, already registered. It is an important tool for cities and regions to reimagine our urban future, embrace nature, and make cities more resilient. Even more exciting is the fact that both cities with nature and regions with nature are recognized in the renewed decision and its plan of action on engagement with subnational governments and other local authorities to enhance implementation of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that was adopted in, uh, at COP15 in Montreal this December last. As the platforms where all levels of subnational and local governments can report on and track their progress against their own commitments by contributing and how, you know, make, make it very visible how they're actually contributing to the implementation of the new global biodiversity framework and national biodiversity strategies and action plans. Our cities are doing fantastic work on the ground, but just how are they implementing NBS or nature-based solutions in their contexts 
Well, one example is in the municipality of Campinas in Brazil, for instance, where ecological corridors are being designed to connect and restore forested fragments of and ecological areas, including legally protected conservation units through their municipal green plan. Four ecological corridors are already formalized. Also at the subnational level, the government of Catalonia in Spain, for instance, a recent Regions with Nature signatory, recently developed a partnership initiative, Prismatic, which is a knowledge based database for the management of natural heritage and biodiversity. The platform includes studies on public health and biodiversity, including how quality urban green spaces can promote physical exercise and reduce obesity. And we know, you know, um, that uh, being connected with nature has so many uh, health effects on urban populations, especially those people who cannot go and afford experiencing nature on holidays and things like that. They are born, they live, and they die in cities. So we've got to create an urban uh, opportunity for them to experience nature in their everyday lives. Today, more than ever, there is a need to embrace nature, reconnect our communities with nature, and make cities feel part of nature. Cities with nature and regions with nature provide the institutional but also the operational network, the space, the tools, and the inspiration for local and subnational governments to work with nature in planning, building, and managing their cities and regions, and to amplify their commitments towards nature and ecosystem restoration, biodiversity conservation, nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation, green and blue infrastructure, and altogether nature-positive development, creating lots of jobs, creating income, and creating quality of life for people. Nature-based solutions such as sponge cities for flood attenuation are more sustainable, affordable, and have many more additional benefits to the community than engineered, hard, grey infrastructure. We cannot afford not to implement these green solutions on our doorstep, use our sunlight, use our open spaces in a way that work for people. Local governments in particular have a critically important role to play as they are very well positioned to tackle and understand specific challenges within their own context and to work in driving necessary transformations and actions, learning from each other, sharing and leapfrogging technology. In conclusion, as noted by Antonio Guterres, it's time for us to make peace with nature. Against the backdrop of the triple crises of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, we need to work with nature, not against it. If this planet and our future generations will thrive or even survive. Nature provides us with enormous potential in cities if we do it right. We can truly regenerate our cities by shaping nature within them. By working collectively with a sense of urgency, we can play our way towards a more nature-positive economy, bringing nature back to the core of our societies for the benefit of nature, people, their health, and their economies. Truly becoming cities with nature. Cities are part of nature, not removed from it. And we should all embrace the benefit that nature provides for us in our urban context, also for our health, our community health, our individual health, our spiritual, physical, and mental health and well being. I thank you and look forward to the rest of the panel's interventions. Thank you very much. Toby, thank you very much. That was excellent. I now have the honor of uh, introducing uh, Leggy Siru, who is a regional policy coordinator for the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network from Fiji. Leggy. Thank you, Dennis Mbulovinaka, and it's a, a great pleasure to join you all here in uh, Bangkok. Um, I'd like to begin by saying as a, as a young indigenous person, it is clear to me 
and many other young people across the world that we are in the midst of a poly crisis and that we are headed towards a global cataclysm. We have so far crossed six out of the nine planetary boundaries and every day of inaction is an opportunity for more bad news. I come from a region where island states like Kiribati and Tuvalu have their highest land elevation standing at only two meters above sea level. Water and food security, livelihoods and the future of the people and the communities in these islands are under immediate threat from climate change and sea level rise. And yet the current combined climate pledges puts the world on track to 2.5 degrees Celsius of warming by the end of the century, which is grossly inadequate and is far from achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius under the Paris Agreement. For the Pacific and many other small island states, 1.5 degrees is not a target. It is our lifeline. The climate crisis has rolled back decades of de development gains and have compounded some of the existing social and economic challenges, including our health systems. And there are countries that have already announced the challenges of meeting the SDGs targets as a result of this poly crisis, including the debt crisis, the mounting debt crisis that we're facing in the region. So as the climate-induced disasters more, become more frequent and increasing in intensity, our public health systems are stressed, health infrastructures sustain costly damages, and people suffer from accessing life-saving health services. Already our health systems is already trying to address issues such as non-communicable diseases. In fact, we are one of the regions with the highest rate of NCDs. In Fiji alone, four out of five deaths are attributed to NCDs, that's 80%. Cost of fresh and nutritious vegetables and crops skyrocket after every climate-induced disasters, propelling consumers to spend their limited disposable income on alternative, cheap, processed, import, shifting the power, and we have to take back that power. At this juncture, I'd like to underscore the critical role that young people, women, and indigenous groups and communities play in offering solutions to these shared global challenges. These groups and communities are actively working within social movements to transform the broken systems that has brought us to where we are at today, and also the, carrying out the important work of changing hearts and minds, behaviors, and attitudes. As a collective force, they have extraordinary potential to mobilize and build public pressure and influence tangible positive, cha positive change in national and global social, political, economic, and ecological uh, systems. So in terms of solution, we firstly need to address the issue of disconnectedness. The triple planetary crisis that we face stems from an origin of disconnectedness that we as humankind ha um, have with nature today. We've seen ourselves as to dominate and exploit other species and the natural ecosystem around us. In the Pacific, our cultures and traditions grounds us as stewards and custodians of the natural environment. And this is common in many other indigenous communities. As we talk about solutions, we have a lot to draw and learn from indigenous communities in the way that they've managed these natural resources and learn to bridge ways and learn to bridge this disconnect. Or as Vandana Shiva had alluded to uh, earlier this morning, uh, to address a separation, uh, the fact that we are separated from the environment. So we need to reawaken our consciousness. The fact that we are the extension of the natural environment and not the other way around. We need to re-educate our communities, promoting values-based systems that draws from the rich body of knowledge and practice of local indigenous communities. Secondly, participation. There's a great need to engage in a deeper way and a very meaningful and deliberate way with local communities, genuinely and proactively, working with civil society and local communities to identify and shape solutions that are context and culturally appropriate and that are scalable and are sustainable. Young people have emerged in recent years as an important policy focus. And whilst we have seen them excluded 
from most of the economic and decision-making processes, we are also the ones who will live the longest with the consequences of the decisions that are being made today. Thirdly, partnerships. There is a strong need for a shift towards equitable and complementary partnerships between local, national, and international actors. Partnerships with youth, women, and indigenous communities and groups must be based on equitable and ethical practice practices. These partnerships must build systems and processes which mirror the ambitions and goals of the groups and communities, and th there must be deliberate efforts to increase the power and the decision-making of these actors, including uh, youth, women, and indigenous communities. Finally, funding. Youth, women, and indigenous communities and other local communities need to have access to direct funding with limited to no barrier, simply simplified access to, uh, to, to finance. They just need the support and the opportunities from governments, from development partners in private sector, and the involvement of their own communities. Providing access to education and financing, boosting their creativity and innovation, and simply believing in their ideas will help them identify, implement, and scale locally-led solutions. With this kind of support, civil society can play a critical role, and a huge role, in bringing the world, in bringing about the world we want by 2030 a world of peace, prosperity, and inclusion, and leaving no one behind. Thank you. Leggy, thank you very much. That was excellent. Uh, before I turn to our next speaker, I just want to remind uh, everyone, we will, uh, when the presentations are finished, I would like to open it up for um, you to be able to intervene and ask questions, and so in both aisles, there are microphones. Think of your questions and we will move forward. Our next and last panelist is uh, Maria Nera, who is the Assistant Director General at WHO for, among other things, the uh, Department of Environment, Climate Change, and Health at the World Health Organization. Maria? Maria, you're, you're on mute. No, I'm not. Oh. You're Can okay you now. now. You're good. Yes. No, I was saying, Dennis, thank you very much. And what a privilege to participate at this uh, prestigious conference and being among uh, such a prestigious speakers before me. Thank you for the opportunity. Let me um, respond to this very ambitious call by the conference organizers setting a new health agenda. I think this is one of the most beautiful uh, challenges that we can have in front of us, very inspiring and of course, extremely ambitious, but at the same time, something so basic that we have no other way than responding on a very pragmatic, strategic, and hopefully action-oriented way. Let me maybe start uh, taking back my hat as a, as a physician, as a medical doctor that I was one day and put my white coat on it, it's not the one, but uh, uh, trying to be, and they start with a diagnosis. Uh, the speakers who were before me did already a presentation, a description, description of the situation we are facing now. And of course, it's, it's, it's good to remind ourselves that every year we are throwing to our oceans eight tons, of, millions of tons of plastic or that the 75% the of the land is already used for human activity, or the fat, which is one of the most um, dramatic ones for me, or painful at least, that we, every minute, we give $11 million on subsidies to fossil fuels, which are the ones that are literally, literally killing us. So that diagnosis, among many others that we can, uh, of course, the deforestation, which is so uh, painful as well. But in terms of health, there is a very, very serious diagnostic as well. 13 million premature deaths every year are occurring because of exposure to preventable environmental risk factors, preventable environmental risk factors. Among them, the horrible 7 million premature deaths caused by exposure to the bad quality, the toxic quality of the air we breathe. I mean, 7 million deaths because we cannot breathe a minimum 
of uh, quality on the earth that we need to survive. We are celebrating this year, this week, the, the 10th anniversary of Ella Kisi Debra that uh, I, I hope is mobilizing and then raising awareness to the terrible situation when we you cannot breathe the air that will maintain you at least alive. This girl passed away with a terrible case of asthma caused by exposure to the bad quality of the air she was breathing every day because of the vulnerability and because of the economic conditions she was facing. This cannot be repeated. So this is the diagnostic, already very dramatic and very clear. I think the scientific community has responded to this responsibility of providing a very good assessment with data, which is extremely solid scientific evidence and, and allow us now to have no excuses for the next, which is what are the prescriptions? That's the diagnostic. Let's now move on the prescriptions. Let's now move from this crisis that we need to face and maybe engage on these healthy transitions that we need to ensure. Three transitions are fundamental to protect our health. Healthy transition to better urban planning. And uh, of course, I clay was very clear on describing some of those interventions so much needed for our population. In 20 years, 70% of all of us, we will be living in urban areas. No way to escape on doing a better, healthy urban planning that will pre pre protect us from exposure to air pollution, traffic incidents, bad use of the energy, obesity, because we cannot move, and uh, a, a lack of physical activity and interaction, and therefore social uh, mental health uh, protected as well. Second transition, the transition to sustainable food systems. That is one of the most critical ones where the public health community needs to insist, needs to influence, needs to use the health argument to promote more action on that. And of course, the third transition is the transition to clean, sustainable, modern sources of energy. The energy that will not cause this pollution, the energy that will help us to reduce the, 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 the horrible figure of the 7 million, million deaths that we have every year. These three transitions need to be led by the health community at large. When I say public health communities at large, all of those who are interested on humans, on protecting the most vulnerable, on protecting our society and putting some basic common sense public health approach to solve these three crises that are definitely uh, uh, challenging us and, and creating a uh, society that is now paralyzed. Let's move as well from the apocalyptic messages to maybe action-oriented and positive one. We need to give hope to our uh, young colleagues, the, the ones sitting there from the Pacific. They need to hear that there is action that is possible. We need to decarbonize our health system. By doing that, we will already contributing to reduce by 5% or maybe even more the, the, the carbon footprint that we have at the moment. We need to empower our health community for them to feel a strong and influencing energy ministers, influencing environmental ministers, influencing agricultural ministers, economy ministers, and the governments to take better actions. We need to use the nature-based solutions. I'm very happy that some of them have been very well described because if we implement the nature-based solutions, we can already respond with 30% of the requirements of the climate mitigation and adaptation. So you see, if we start to add all of that, we can already uh, uh, mobilize our society. So my call on this uh, new uh, setting, the new health agenda is for facing the crisis we have at the moment, use the health argument, the health co-benefits that we can obtain if we tackle the causes of climate change and pollution, if we move as a society on what we call in WHO the healthy and green and fair recovery with six uh, um, uh, prescriptions on our manifesto that I invite all of you to have a look at that. Very basic ones, very, I think, uh, common sense 
as strategic and at the same time cost effective, and that will create a positive and, and rewarding feel, uh, feeling in our, in our communities. Uh, my last point is that uh, definitely we need to help as well uh, access and facilitate access to the different channels and, 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 and uh, for, for, for the financial resources. At the moment, that wall is difficult to navigate, and I think we have a, 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 an opportunity to help the, the, the communities to access those channels of funds and making sure that they are more transparent and more accessible to all of them. So to finalize, uh, uh, I, I think we, we have a, an enormous opportunity in front of those threats to change the, and, and set this new health agenda, but we should not underestimate our own power of public health uh, officers. We cannot keep on our hospital work, on the, the curative work. We need to get out of our hospitals and we need to influence any single sector that we have something to say on the way we will change in our life. And again, make sure that uh, you use the health argument. There are plenty of opportunities that will not come automatically, that for sure. But uh, they will be there if we want to use it and create the network that is needed and the movement that will be aligning on these healthy prescriptions for a healthy and green and fair transition. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Maria. Could I ask that we are able to put all three virtual presenters on the screen? And as we're doing that, um, and before I turn to the audience, there, there is one question that I would like to ask. And as we talk about challenges and opportunities, we've heard in a variety of the discussions today about how over the last century, the dynamics, particularly in the wealthy countries in the world, have begun driving our economies through consumption. And as we think about the increased demands for energy, the increased demands for uh, natural uh, minerals, uh, the food consumption patterns that have become dominant over the last half century, how do we begin thinking about transforming what I would think would be a uh, incompatible um, economic model for the globe if we're going to have a sustainable economy. Uh, Dr. Shiva, I'd be very interested in hearing from you how we begin to think about transforming how we are consuming um, the planet itself as we go forward into this century, and how do we, what's the opportunity we have to transform those particular patterns? Uh, Dr. Shiva, you're on mute, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I think what we've had is, you know, a leftovers of colonialism that our young friend from Fiji talked about and a maldevelopment model, which was basically promoting consumerism, promoting resource use beyond any planetary limits, which is why we have a climate crisis, which, we, which is why we have species extinction. But we also have the human degradation. It's not that we did better in the process. And the fact that humans have lost out on health, their well-being and their right to health and good food hand in hand with the region of the planet. And I think what, what needs to be done is take all the streams where a redefining of the human evolution on the basis of the Earth's limits, the human potential, and biodiversity, but also cultural diversity. Because, you know, why is everyone eating the same junk food everywhere when we have so much diversity in our systems? when we have so much diversity in our knowledge systems. I think this is a moment to take, the, A, first and foremost, if people are alive in the world today, it's because they were living in sustainable ways. And that's a majority world. It's just that it's being trampled on. 
And we need to, you know, all the islands of the Pacific, all the mountain regions of the world, all the deserts of the world, all the small farms of the world, they are there as examples. And it's just the block in the mind that somehow our living is less than those who colonized us. That assumption must go. We live well. And I think a fossil fuel driven predatory economy fails on all criteria of an economy. Economy means art of living, according to Aristotle. Art of living. Crematistics is what has been promoted. Art of money making. We need to de-addict ourselves both from fossil fuels as well as crematistics. Thank you very much. Let me turn to the audience. Are there questions that people would like to pose? And don't be shy. Then let me turn, as we, like he's, if we talk about the responsibilities of the global community towards dealing with uh, the small islands, the small nations of the world, and the vulnerabilities that climate change are bringing uh, to bear. What are the, again, thinking about the opportunities, what are the opportunities we have to really bring the kind of uh, solidarity uh, with the populations of the islands in the region that you live in, but globally at large. Thank you. Um, one of the things with the Pacific is we're still reeling uh, from um, colonialism. And, and colonialism has really, you know, entrenched into um, our way of life. And there's, you know, social, uh, political uh, consequences of that. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in my home country, we've undergone four military coups in uh, the span of 40 years and seen three constitution. And, and that is the result because of, you know, this um, ethnic and racial division uh, brought about by the uh, colonial administration. And there are many other Pacific Island countries that are still under colonial um, rule. You know, they're still um, part of the... Uh, uh, they're being te their territories to to France and the U.S. and um, other countries, and one of the and 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 of course, as Dr. Shiva had mentioned, you know, over the last two hundred years, as a result of um, um, propping up economic, you know, uh, industrialization, we in the Pacific are feeling the brunt of that. The Pacific contributes. A, you know, a drop to the bucket in terms of global carbon emissions, 0.0001% of global carbon emissions. But there are countries like Tuvalu and Kiribati that are going to go underwater over the next 50 years. And, and we're, you know, um, and, and, and so in, in, in the question of solidarity, we are clear about our message to the global community in addressing the climate crisis, and that is to accelerate the transition to low carbon green economies. The solutions are there. We know the money is out there. We've now established the, you know, a new um, loss and damage fund at COP27. No, it's still an empty bucket at this point. In fact, um, the, you know, the adaptation fund was up for replenishment. Uh, the 100 billion goal that was pledged by developed countries hasn't been met. And now we have another additional fund uh, that, you know, there's they still questions around how it's going to be met. And yet we see money flowing into mil global military, military uh, complexes. We see money flowing into uh, fossil fuel, 11 million um, per, uh, was it, uh, uh, per day or per hour, uh, flowing into, you know, as, as subsidies into the uh, fossil fuel industries. And we really need to, you know, we've... Uh, our leaders and the people from uh, the Pacific have cried, have you know, have spoken up, have pleaded with the global community about the kind of solidarity that's needed. It's really political will, and we are up against corporate influence. We are, you know, uh, this one percent of people that um, rules over fifty percent of the, you know, the, the global um, uh, resources. So. I think in terms of solidarity, we really need to build that pressure from the, from the ground up. 
Uh, it's the people who hold the power that you know that needs to be constantly reminded. We need to change governments that you know that are, are regressive in terms of uh, of their climate policies. And in order to do that, we need to build power within social movements from the ground uh, to you know to to vote this um, uh, leaders out. Great, thank you, uh, Kobe. Could you say uh, really? Help us understand what we, you would see the single biggest par, uh, barrier towards adopting uh, a nature-based um, sort of solution, particularly within urban settings. Right. I think I think what we need to understand is that uh, from from my world, we 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 work with cities specifically, municipal municipalities. Um, we mostly, and also provinces and states, um, um, we need to understand that there is a one-size-fits-all solution. Every community, every settlement, every city is different and unique. And one needs to actually treasure that and build on that. It's also in a city where... Uh, incubation takes place where things happen much more quickly than at the national or global scale. Decisions are made at global level and national level, but they're implemented. Uh, the action takes happen, uh, happens on the ground. You know, it takes place closest to the people within communities. So therefore, the innovation in communities should be harnessed. And we should also understand that, that a city works like, a, it's, it's very systemic, you know, it works like a very complicated system. And we talked about health, we talked about uh, food systems, we talked about, well, we can talk about infrastructure systems, water, wastewater, all those things. They all link so closely to health, to addressing, for instance, um, uh, uh, climate change, um, uh, etc. But there is this thread of nature that binds all of these things together. Whether we're coming in from, from whichever angle, an economic, uh, economic angle or a social angle, public health angle, uh, um, um, consumption and production patterns, um, they all come together in a city. So I would say we should embrace our urban new world. We, it's a brave new urban world. It's not equal by far. And we should look at and very open, open eyed and very soberly look at the inequalities in our very own cities and start there. Start addressing a linkage between those who have and those who have not. And then try and build partnerships, innovative partnerships around things that they have in common. They all want and need clean environment. They all want and need clean and good nutrition, water, that sort of thing. So let's start with what people have in common living in cities. They care deeply often for their place where they live. And let's embrace that cultural aspect, that community aspect as well. And within that, we can harness so many solutions. Um, I can go on. This is a topic very close to my heart. But I would say let's embrace our urban future. There's a lot to learn from it. And there's a lot we can do in such a space where such a lot of human beings from different walks of life come together and live together, play, work, and live together. That's where the answer lies <laughs> to many great. of these things. Thank you very much. We're, we're really running out of time right now. What I'd like to do is just uh, turn to Maria and then follow with uh, uh, David for some final comments. Maria? Thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, we will, again, respond, we need to respond in a very strategic way and inspiring way to the crisis we are facing. And again, quantifying the health benefits that all of these interventions can have in our society, even at urban level, when you try to convince a mayor of the importance of doing something to tackle the causes of climate change, if you quantify the health benefits that this intervention can have, this is an extra value and, and, and something that uh, will mobilize the community. So this health argument can be very strong at COP28. I count on all of you to, to push for this health argument together with WHO and others uh, 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 at the COP28 because we have a lot to gain on the negotiations. We need to stop emissions, reduce emissions, but we need as well 
to make sure that nat nature-based solutions and health is protected and promoted by quantifying all of this, uh, all of those health benefits. I think we can advance on a very quick and ambitious way. Thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, this morning, we heard that life is fundamentally about a number of different living systems that are interconnected. They exist in symbiosis. And I would like to suggest that what I've learned from this panel session, this plenary session, is that public health is about the health of living systems everywhere, that the humans within those living systems will only benefit if the systems as a whole are healthy, that means sustainable, resilient, and most of all, equitable. And I believe the biggest challenge ahead is that the rich are going to do fine. Probably they will excel in a warming and even less biodiverse earth. They'll create natural parks where they can go and play and they will have lots of air conditioning that will keep them at a good temperature. But half the world, perhaps even more, is just gonna have a really rough time. And that's, they're already having a rough time as far as I can tell. And that's where I believe we have to focus in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. David, thank you. So in conclusion, let me just couple of words. One, it, it's clear that for us to navigate our way forward, uh, we need to take responsibility for the footprints that we place on this planet. We can't divorce ourselves from those footprints and the consequences. But I think, as Maria said, we shouldn't underestimate our power. Our ability to reimagine our relationship with this planet and transform that relationship into one that is both uh, if you will, a planetary partnership of which we are just one species that is part of it. The opportunity is there, but it clearly requires some significant social reengineering. People need to think differently. They need to understand our place on this planet differently. Um, and the opportunities we have, of course, is to bring that transformation. Um, the youth clearly represent that opportunity and the opportunity to educate the youth so that they know as they grow older, they have a responsibility to this planet. But it doesn't just begin with the youth, it begins with us as well. So we have a responsibility. Um, it's our footprint that is transforming um, this planet. And until we take responsibility for that, um, we're going to continue uh, to deal with these uh, undesired consequences. So with that, let me thank our panel, um, Dr. Shiva, uh, Maria, Kobe, David, and Leggy. Thank you all very much. Greatly appreciated. <laughs>